The fact that I learned Dead End Paranormal Park got renewed for a season two from a screenshot of a tweet making fun of Queen Elizabeth's death is modern internet culture at its finest. Dead End covers a wide range of topics and themes over the course of its first 10 episodes, and these ideas all contribute to a central thesis statement about the human need for meaningful relationships and what it truly means to go home. Hungarian-Canadian psychologist Dr. Gabor Matei posits that human beings require two basic things for survival, attachment and authenticity. Attachment pertains to the loving connections we make, and authenticity applies to our capacity to know and express ourselves genuinely. By no means are these two needs mutually exclusive, but they're often pitted against each other in a stifling conflict. If we choose to be authentic, then we run the risk of being rejected by our loved ones. And if we choose our attachments, then we might have to ignore our true selves. To quote Matei, if our environment cannot support our gut feelings and emotions, then in order to belong and fit in, we will automatically, unwittingly, and unconsciously suppress our emotions and our connections to ourselves for the sake of staying connected to the nurturing environment. A lot of children are in this dilemma. Can I feel and express what I feel? Or do I have to suppress that in order to be acceptable, to be a good kid? Automatically, we disconnect from ourselves in order to continue to be looked after. It's a tragic choice. It's not even a choice. The child's not aware of making a choice. It's an automatic process. Each member of Dead End's main cast is confronted with this choice at some point during the series. Should I be inauthentic and connected, or should I be authentic and risk isolation? Their choices reveal why the found family trope is so popular. If we make loving connections with people who appreciate our authentic selves, then we aren't forced to make this impossible decision. Ask me what my biggest weakness is. Oily skin? I'm serious. I was gonna go with something like paralyzing fear of confrontation. What's interesting about Barney's self-proclaimed greatest weakness is that it's also a survival instinct. A fear of confrontation stems from our inner sense of self-preservation, so I personally don't blame Barney for running away from home. His parents say they accept him but they let his grandmother verbally accost him at the dinner table. And in both fictional and real world settings, a dinner table is supposed to be a safe space. In his book, How to Read Literature Like a Professor, Thomas C. Foster says, the act of taking food into our bodies is so personal that we really only want to do it with people we're very comfortable with. Barney removes himself from harm's way and gets a job at Phoenix Parks, which offers him an alcove where he can truly be authentic. This is the first place I've ever felt like I could just truly be myself. I'm trans, Norma. And everyone at school knows, and everyone at home knows. And being here, it's like a whole new place. I can just be Barney, and I can choose if and when I tell people. And trust me, we see that Barney's biggest fear isn't his grandmother. He's afraid that his parents don't have his back. And in one of the most wholesome moments from the episode, Norma doesn't hesitate to stand up for him. Barney's friends love him unconditionally. That's not to say his family doesn't care about him. They do, but they struggle with demonstrating that. Excuse me, we're having a family discussion. Oh, sorry, we didn't mean to- So are we. The entire scene at the saloon is just chef's kiss. I love that the background is colored like the trans flag. I love how Patrick just doesn't understand the subtext surrounding the nachos and what can only be described as the quintessential younger sibling experience. And I love all of Barney's rebuttals. Oh, I don't get it. We accepted you. That is what parents are supposed to do. That's the bare minimum. What about that dinner? What, what dinner? You know what dinner. To once again quote Dr. Matei, if the parents themselves are not in touch with their feelings, they can't tolerate the child's feelings because they threaten them. We learn in the season finale that Barney's mom also represses herself in order to keep the peace with Granny Gran. Trauma like this is generational. Mrs. Gutman never wanted to hurt her son, but she was taught to suppress her own authenticity in order to stay connected with her mother, and she expected Barney to do the same. I think running away might be a Gutman family trait. I'm scared of confronting my mom too. Barney is a great protagonist, and I'm really excited to see how his character progresses in Dead End's second season. <gasps> my little good boy hat! Rascal, you want me to buy you a little good boy hat? I'll take that as a no. In my experience, a talking dog can either make or break a piece of media. I unironically love Descendants 2, but every time Dude opens his CGI mouth, I want to jump out of my own skin and curl up in a sobbing heap. On the contrary, Pugsley is the best boy who deserves all the belly rubs. Now say, hmm, indubitably. 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 
Out of the four main characters, Pugsley has the best immediate grasp of the attachment authenticity conflict, which makes sense to me because dogs have the greatest capacity for unconditional love. After learning that his dog can talk, Barney tries to hide Pugsley away from other people because he wants to protect his best friend. But this culminates in a shouting match where Pugsley hits Barney with a very uncomfortable truth. Why can't you just be like you used to be? Used to be, used to be. You know what, Barney? You sound just like Grammy Graham. Pugsley values his connection with Barney, but he prioritizes his authenticity. And Barney quickly comes around when he realizes he's at fault. Pugsley reminded me how important it is to live your life without apology. Pugsley's primary conflict in the show is sharing his body with the Demon King, Temelucus. But the character who actually grows more from this cohabitation is Temelucus. The human's mine! Oh no, you don't! Ah! He claims that humans made him soft, but he just learns the same lesson as the rest of our protagonists. He chooses his authentic self over his superficial attachment to his sister. He also loves the little good boy hat as much as Pugsley does, and I think that's neat. I started talking to myself, and man, I'm so rude. God, Courtney's voice is so familiar. Who voices Courtney in Dead End? Emily Osment! Courtney is a ton of fun. She actually reminds me of Anya from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which is one of the highest compliments I can give a character because I adore Anya. I don't have a date for the prom. Men are evil. Will you go with me? I am not a prize to be won, unless you're hot. Or rich. <laughs> or hot and rich. Courtney is fascinating because she always behaves like her authentic self. What differentiates her from the rest of the main cast is that she lacks attachments of any kind, healthy or otherwise. She wants one thing more than anything else in the world. She wants to go home to the demon realm, but her cuffs prevent her from descending down Dead End's elevator. Over the course of the series, though, it becomes apparent that she hasn't been home in centuries, if in fact at all. And as a result, she's really, really lonely. Ugh, come on! I just want to watch TV and hate myself in peace! When you're isolated and alone, you tend to idealize a place where that loneliness can be easily cured. Courtney has convinced herself that the demon realm is where she'll find her people and finally belong. She's attached to the notion of home because that's her coping mechanism. Barney, Norma, and Pugsley challenge this preconception by befriending Courtney and creating a found family together. When the four of them fight at the end of the Pauline Phoenix experience, I buy the conflict because both sides are in the wrong here. Throughout the episode, Courtney keeps saying that mushy human stuff isn't her forte, which makes sense because she's never experienced connection with other people before now. She lacks situational awareness and is inconsiderate of Norma's emotional state. Callous disregard often cuts deeper than malicious intent. But Barney and Pugsley lash out at Courtney for misreading the situation and berate her for her lack of tact. I didn't know this was a secret human-only club! Humans and dogs. You keep your distance with mushy human stuff. We don't need you right now. Courtney becomes a prime target for Pauline's manipulations when she's cut off from the only healthy attachment she's ever made. Going home becomes her top priority again. In her solo from Phantom of the Theme Park, Courtney sings about her idealized version of the demon realm. I'll be one of the guys with the Lord of the Flies in Beelzebub's bachelor pad. Home is so appealing to her because she thinks she'll find fellow depraved sinners who value the same things she does. Thus, they will value her authentic self, too. Her heart is hellbound, and ultimately, she gets her wish. Zagan frees her of her cuffs, and Courtney gets to go home, but she discovers that it's fairly underwhelming. Hey, it's my welcome home party! Anyone for karaoke? Oh, great. There are a few things more cliched than saying home is where the heart is, but the phrase is true. In the context of this essay, home is where the authentic attachments are. Courtney thought she'd find connections in the demon realm, but her true home is with Barney, Pugsley, and Norma. You came home. Oh, jeez. Side note, I've read the theories that postulate Courtney is a fallen angel, and I'm really hoping that's the case. I think it would be an interesting story arc because it would further challenge Courtney's worldview and perception of herself. Speaking of worldviews that got shattered. You're my This is the only song from the musical episode that's currently on Spotify, and I'm begging whoever's in charge to release the rest of them. I can't stop listening to Put Me in the Driver's Seat. So you might as well put me in the driver. Put me in the driver, put me in the driver's seat. <laughs> 
Norma's hyperfixation with Pauline is her most important attachment throughout season one. The real world is Norma's fear world, but Pauline's filmography offered her an avenue of reprieve. Over the course of the series, Norma learns about Pauline's darker side and struggles to come to terms with all of her idol's personal failings. Well, who else could it be? Pauline! Pauline! What? The term parasocial relationship has become more common in the modern vernacular due to the ever-growing access we have to celebrities through social media and the internet. Dr. Sabrina Romanoff defines them as one-sided relationships where one individual will extend their time, energy, and emotional interest, and the other individual is usually unaware of the other's existence. They're tricky relationships to navigate because media has such a high capacity for therapeutic experiences. That's part of the reason why representation is so important. It helps us remember that we aren't alone. But actors and writers and YouTubers aren't your friends. They're strangers who make things that you either like or dislike. And these relationships become even harder to navigate if you experience an intense disillusionment with a creator who provided you with an escape from the harshness of reality. You're forced to ask a lot of difficult questions like, should you continue supporting the work? And is death of the author applicable? And how do you differentiate the creation from the creator? I don't know. It's a choice every person has to make for themselves, and Norma's initial choice is to stay in a perfectly curated fantasy world. I'm staying here. But none of this is real. I can stay here forever with Pauline. With my Pauline! I can be whoever she needs me to be! Norma's formed other attachments, though. She's developed real friendships with Barney, Bodia, Pugsley, and Courtney. It's always hard to make connections, but they can be tremendously helpful with navigating the real world. There are so many layers to Norma's solo and Phantom of the Theme Park. After bringing the monster to life, Dr. Frankenstein utterly rejects his creation. He refuses to name it, addressing him only with cruel terms such as wretch and demon. All the monster wants is love and acceptance, but he's denied at every turn. In her song, Norma equates Pauline to Frankenstein, but in a refreshing twist, the creation gets to reject the creator. It's kind of messed up, I feel like a breakup, except it's all your fault. Not I can't wait for Dead End Season 2. This show is smart, funny, and heartfelt. And since Netflix sucks at promoting shows, then I'll do it myself. Go watch the series. You'll be glad you did.